Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the Civil Rights Movement of the 50s and 60s. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement uh, was characterized really by uh, nonviolent tactics, uh, tactics such as sit-ins, uh, sit-ins in places like Woolworths. In February of 1960, Woolworths, which was a department store chain or a, a store chain in the South and in the North, really, but in the South they had segregated their lunch counters. In other words, there were certain parts of the lunch counter where you could go and only blacks were allowed to sit and certain parts where whites were allowed to sit. Uh, and uh, civil rights protesters in the South felt that this was uh, not correct. And so they went ahead and they had sit-ins where a bunch of uh, black and white folks would go and sit down at the lunch counters together, all mixed together, uh, rather than in a segregated fashion. Uh, and, and these sit-ins, uh, they would go ahead and the, the store would go ahead and try to remove the, the protesters and uh, would usually turn into somebody calling the police. They were accused of trespassing. They were drug out. And this was all caught on television, really. Uh, and so for the first time, many people across the country got to see just kind of how ugly segregation could be. Uh, people shouting at these protesters for doing nothing more than sitting in a seat, spitting on them, dumping food on them. Uh, and, and really, it's one of the things that really starts to turn people's opinions towards segregation. They see segregation as, uh, as hateful. Uh, and, and this takes place really in North Carolina um, in, uh, in 1960. Uh, but it eventually will spread very quickly, actually, all across the South. And Woolworths will go ahead and be forced uh, to desegregate their lunch counters in, in 1960, uh, just simply by public pressure. Uh, and so Woolworths goes ahead and makes that decision in July of 1960, uh, just about six months after the protests began. Uh, other t protests include things like Freedom Rides. Freedom Rides were sponsored by the Congress of Racial Equality, also known as CORE. And really what Freedom Rides were meant to do was they were meant to go ahead and make sure that a a groundbreaking Supreme Court case was upheld. The Supreme Court case was Morgan versus Virginia. And what the Supreme Court said there is that basically you couldn't have segregated interstate travel. That if you were on a bus or a train or a plane that started in one state and the trip ended in another state, then there couldn't be a black section and a white section. And so what folks would do is the Freedom Rides would start off in the north, up in maybe Maryland uh, or, or maybe even in Virginia, and all the black people and the white people would get together and craziness, they would all sit next to one another. Uh, and then they would ride across the South. And through Virginia, that really wasn't a big deal. Um, North Carolina, they might have started getting a few more looks. By the time they got to South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama, their reception was getting pretty hostile. Uh, so much so that uh, they would be met outside of towns and uh, people would be drug off the buses and beaten. The buses' tires would become slashed. Uh, and it was a real safety issue. Uh, and so the, the protesters appeal for protection. Well, the local police aren't going to protect them because in many cases, the local police were, were in agreement with the, pro, with the folks who were trying to go ahead and stop the rides across the South. So Robert Kennedy, the, the president's brother, the attorney general of the United States, uh, steps in and he, he goes ahead and has federal marshals escort the, the buses across the South. Uh, and so again, this was another tactic, another... Uh, way to go ahead and make sure uh, that uh, segregation would come to an end, to protest segregation. Uh, and, and probably the most notable uh, form of protest, the most famous protest of the civil rights era occurs on August 28, 1963, uh, when civil rights protesters march on Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a protest for a civil rights bill that actually ends up dying in 1963, but will come back and be passed in 1964. The Civil Rights of 1960, Act of 1964 Still a groundbreaking piece of legislation, far-reaching piece of legislation. It's in effect today, establishes things like affirmative action, and, and not just racial discrimination, but gender discrimination, and things like that. But it's during this protest for this piece of legislation that Martin Luther King delivers what has really become uh, the, the, the seminal moment of the civil rights movement, and that's his I Have a Dream speech, uh, where he, he says, you know, I have a dream that one day uh, my children be judged uh, by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And this really becomes uh, kind of the, the, the pivotal moment, the, the pinnacle of the civil rights movement. Uh, other ways that the civil rights movement goes ahead and tries to achieve its ends, uh, court cases. There's a lot of court cases that come about. Like, and the most famous is, is probably Brown versus Board of Education. We've already talked about Morgan versus Virginia. Uh, but Brown versus Board of Education, again, a Supreme Court decision. And it actually overturns a prior Supreme Court decision. This doesn't happen a whole heck of a lot. Uh, but where the Supreme Court actually reverses itself. The old case was Plessy versus Ferguson, which said, look, you could have separate facilities as long as they were equal. So 
you could have two separate buses, a black bus and a white bus, as long as it was the same bus. You could have two separate schools, a black school and a white school, as long as the schools were similarly funded. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education says, no, you can't do that. There is no separate but equal, especially in regards to education. That by, by its very nature, separate is not equal. and says that you have to integrate schools uh, uh, racially across the United States. And so this was a huge landmark decision, which really drastically changes uh, the way our country handles civil rights and deals with civil rights. Uh, and, and while most of the, the tactics of the civil rights protesters were not violent, oftentimes they were met with violence. Uh, examples uh, in our universities, uh, uh, Ole Miss in 1962, uh, a civil rights worker, James Meredith, is murdered. Uh, University of Alabama, a year later in 1963, the governor himself, uh, a guy by the name of George Wallace at the time, stands in the doors of the University of Alabama to try to prevent uh, African American students from entering. Uh, and, and he is removed by the National Guard, by federal troops. Uh, in, in Birmingham, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, a uh, young black African American male, uh, Medgar Evers, is killed in 1963. A black church uh, is bombed. Uh, the, the protesters that, that result from that, uh, the local authorities turn fire hoses on them, they unleash uh, police dogs on them, and it gets pretty nasty. Uh, other things that, uh, that characterize the civil rights movement, a voting drive, again, another tactic that was used. Uh, voting drives were uh, a bunch of usually northern college students that went to the south in the summer of 1964. This is the SETI setting for the movie Mississippi Burning. Um, and this is something that was common. Uh, the March on Montgomery, uh, where three people were killed. It starts actually in Selma. 25,000 people take part. It ends up becoming protected by federal troops. Um, and again, a protest uh, for voting rights. Uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is the end of that, where finally uh, things like the poll tax, which was a special tax that you had to pay to vote, uh, which was really discriminatory against African Americans. The literacy test. Um, the literacy test was really just signing your name. Uh, and the idea was that in order to vote, you had to be able to read the card, which, which makes some degree of sense. But the way it was enforced in the South was really the problem. In the South, there were a lot of people who were illiterate, both black and white. But if you were a white person, you showed up to the polls and you couldn't sign your name, they would just say, make your mark, and you make an X, and you go ahead and vote. If you were a black person and you showed up and you couldn't sign your name, which, again, wasn't uncommon, uh, they'd say, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to vote. And so it wasn't really enforced equally. And so the literacy test and the poll tax are made illegal uh, by the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to try to extend the right to vote uh, to African Americans who had been denied that right. 